Welcome to our podcast platform for medical education. We usually provide podcasts for health professionals in German language because our team members all live and work in Germany. Today you're listening to a podcast interview with Professor John Stone, a neurologist from Edinburgh in the UK, who has specialized in functional neurological disorders. Today, we're talking to Professor John Stone, who's a consultant neurologist and an honorary professor of neurology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And we're going to talk about functional neurological disorders, also called dissociative disorders. And John, thank you very much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. First of all, um, would you mind to uh, shortly introduce yourself to our listeners, um, and especially maybe you can tell us what made you concentrate your work on, on FND? Yeah, no, thank you, Kai. Um, so I'm a general adult neurologist. I still work full time as a general neurologist, um, and I've been doing research in this area for about 20 years. I suppose I was I became interested in the late 1990s. So I was a re training uh, at that time, and Uh, as in many places, I saw lots of patients with functional disorders, and really, I was just I was baffled as to why more people weren't interested in them. This was a fascinating clinical problem: people with disabilities that seemed to be potentially reversible because they were sort of the software, not the hardware, and yet they were very often treated with um, patients were treated with disdain or ignorance. Um, some pretty shocking things happened. And then and you open a sort of neurology textbook at that time, and there's absolutely nothing about them at all, even though it's a large part of what you're doing. So um, I was driven by that, I think. Well, considering your knowledge and your experience in that field, how would you try to def define that um, the current scientific concept of FND? And how would you probably explain that to a colleague of yours I like to think it does what it says on a tin, really. So we're talking about people who have symptoms which arise from abnormalities of nervous system functioning. Now, of course, it's a bit more than that because, you know, epilepsy is abnormality of nervous system functioning too, but in a different way. So really, FND describes symptoms referable to the voluntary motor and sensory nervous system where typically you can demonstrate that automatic function is normal, but voluntary function is abnormal. So it is a bit more specific than that, isn't it? Um, and then it gets, there are things like, well, how do you classify a dissociative seizure? Does that really follow those rules? Uh, how does that fit in with other functional disorders, like persistent fatigue states or pain, irritable bowel? Uh, so, so the edges of all these disorders are blurry, but we're sort of used to that in, in our specialty, I think. Like, is there any biochemistry m model of, of FND? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, doctors like concepts. Is there anything sort of popping up in, in the scientific field? No, there is. And I think, I think where we're coming to with this is that we've been had a, a very narrow perspective on these disorders, which is that For 100 years, we've been told they're a conversion disorder, they're somehow a psychological problem. We don't really know how that works, but, you know, it's, it's psychiatric, not our problem. And I think where we've come to is that this is a field that requires multiple perspectives. You can't fit it into one perspective. You can't say, it, like MS, it's inflammation. In fact, even if it even even with MS, that that isn't the whole story. You know, it's not just inflammation; it's genetics, it's environment, lots of things. So, in fact, it's it's no less complicated than all of the other conditions I, that we see in neurology. I would say it's something. There is a lot of interesting brain imaging, for example, that shows that patients with FND have abnormalities of their uh, their motor and sensory pathways that are in keeping with the symptoms. And also are in that are different to people who are pretending to have those symptoms. Um, so brain imaging is one perspective. Neurophysiology is another. There is there isn't very much on neurochemistry or genetics, but I'm sure those things are important because this is a problem that's happening in the brain. So how where else can it be going on? Um, and then of course there are the the psychological perspectives and social perspectives which which remain relevant and we shouldn't 
we shouldn't throw those out. Uh, but we need to be able to hold them at the same time as thinking about the brain. And that's what makes it a really challenging, interesting topic, I think. Can you tell us how common are these these functional neurological disorders? We did a study in uh, Scotland, actually led by my colleague, Alan Carson, uh, where we looked at 4,000 new outpatients across Scotland. So it was 45 different neurologists. And we showed it was the second commonest reason to see a neurologist after headache, um, if you sort of group them together. And if you look at, uh, that's, that's the broader sense of all functional disorders. If you look at specifically FND, which means paralysis, tremor, seizures, those sorts of things, you're looking at about um, 7 or 8% of new outpatients have that as a primary diagnosis. That probably equates to around, we think about 50 to 100,000 people in the UK have this. So that would be maybe 150,000 in Germany. Um, I think those figures, those sort of figures are no surprise probably to most neurologists because they know that's what's coming through the door. But it is a, it's a big surprise to the general public. Um, and when you look at conditions that are much rarer, uh, that get a lot more you get more coverage. It's a, it's a very common, perhaps the commonest cause, one might argue, of particularly disability in younger people, um, but just a very hidden one. Can we um, talk about typical misconceptions of FND that you come across, about the um, common misconceptions about psychiatric um, comorbidity? What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, there's a number of these. In fact, we just we just pulled them together. We pulled together 10 myths, actually, misconceptions for a paper in um, the European Journal of Neurology just coming out this week, um, because there are many. And so, yeah, the, psych the psychiatric one is a, is, a, is a good one. People, I mean, it's been enshrined in the diagnosis in DSM-4. You, you couldn't make this diagnosis unless someone had a recent psychological stressor that was relevant to their symptoms. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that uh, there are many people who don't have a recent psychological stressor, probably up to a third or more. Um, and in fact, even when there is a stressor, what, how is, is that definitely relevant? I mean, you often meet people who've, if you, if you ask people with MS or stroke about their life, people are stressed. You know, it's very easy to jump to conclusions. So that's a really good way to get the diagnosis wrong, is to ask someone about stress and then assume that because they've got this symptom, it must be relevant. Um, you know, people, the patients with this disorder do have higher frequencies of adverse experience, both in the distant past and as childhood and more recently, but it's probably no more than people with uh, depression or anxiety, for example. So it should, it's not part of the diagnosis. It's just another risk factor that it can be helpful to ask about, but isn't actually necessary for the diagnosis. Are there any other misconceptions um, that you can point out to our listeners? Well, I think I think one of the biggest ones, that the biggest sort of uh, shift in uh, uh, approach to this area comes from turning around this idea that when, when I started training in neurology, um, there was a lot of diagnosis by exclusion, a lot of negative diagnosis. Someone has a weak leg or has, has a seizure, you do a test, the EEG is normal, the brain scan is normal, and you say, oh, functional disorder. That's bad neurology. You know, we know as neurologists there are many, there are many conditions where MRI is normal. You can have uh, frontal lobe seizures with a normal surface EEG. So, it's not a diagnosis of exclusion. You're looking for positive evidence of the diagnosis. So, for example, Hoover sign in someone with leg weakness or tremor entrainment test for tremor or for seizures. You're looking for a typical dissociative functional seizure. And that would be, for example, you know, someone who falls down, suddenly lies still with their eyes closed, unresponsive for more than two minutes. There is no other condition in medicine that makes you do that. So we... You know, we could save a lot of time actually by just using our clinical knowledge. The the, the massive implication that has it's had a huge it's had a huge uh, benefit for the area because it enables us to make a positive diagnosis with a patient, uh, and it also enables us to identify patients who have a neurological disease like MS, but also have FND because that's quite common 
and that's potentially treatable uh, component of their disability. So, so if I could pick two, really, if I could, yeah, I, I think it's a it's a positive diagnosis, not a diagnosis exclusion, and psychology is just a risk factor. Those would be my top two myths, I would think. My feeling in, in Germany is that uh, the role of the neurologist is still to, to mainly exclude organic causes of the symptoms and then refer the patient to, uh, to a psychiatrist. In your opinion, what is the role, what, what should be the role of the neurologist uh, in 2020 in these kind of um, diseases? Well, I think we should be reclaiming our role in, this, in these disorders back to how things were perhaps in 1920. Uh, I've got on my bookshelf here a uh, textbook of nervous diseases by Oppenheim, which has a which is one of the best neurology book textbooks I know. You know, he's got massive, he's got pages and dozens and dozens of pages on hysteria, neurasthenia, traumatic neurosis. It's quite clear that a neurologist at that time viewed it as their responsibility to be interested in this topic, to work out what was going on, to make it not just make a diagnosis, but think about why has this person got this symptom. What are we going to do about it? So I think we've we've lost many we've lost that skill, but we can regain it again. Um, it turns out to be I, I think the neurologist has a key role in um, explaining the diagnosis to the patient. If that if that bit doesn't go well, nothing else is going to go well. If that patient feels angry or disbelieved, and that they haven't really got an answer, they're just going to keep looking for one. Um, and there are there are there are some patients who don't mind being get, going, being sent to a psychiatrist, but is that psychiatrist going to know about FND? Um, if the neurologist if it hasn't gone well with the neurologist, are they going to be able to make up the lost ground? So neurologists are in a key key uh, point not only of explanation but triage. I think the other thing that we've learned is that the treatment for these disorders is not just psychiatry. That's that's just not the case. That it's multidisciplinary. There are thousands of these patients. They don't all need to see a psychiatrist. It's the first thing. Some of them have quite mild symptoms. Um, some of them with motor symptoms, for example, if they've got paralysis or movement disorder, may be best served initially by um, seeing a physiotherapist that knows about FND. And then maybe they'll need to see a psychologist, psychiatrist later. Maybe they won't. The neurologist is in the position to look at all those things and make those triage decisions. Um, at the moment, the patients very often, in many parts of the world, just fall through the cracks. Um, and there's a huge amount of disability that goes untreated just because people are not paying attention to this disorder or seeing it as something worthwhile treating. Can you give us an idea of what um, physiotherapists are doing with the patients? Uh, um, you know, is there any... Um, special kind of treatment for physiotherapists um, dealing with patients um, with F FND? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, this, this is an area of evolving research. But uh, about four or five years ago, um, I, I collaborated with Mark Edwards, who's a professor in, of neurology in St. George's, and Glenn Nielsen, who's now a senior lecturer in physio. And we Glenn at that time was working at the National Hospital in London and was starting to put into practice these ideas of making a positive diagnosis and showing people. Mark and I were all, had for some time as well been showing people their physical signs. So you show someone their tremor entrainment test, for example, and you can point out to them that their tremor stops when they're distracted. And you use that as part of the um, explanation process. Glenn was extending that saying, how can we use those things in physio? And actually, the physio, what you end up with is a physiotherapy that is really quite different to the physio that we'd use for someone with stroke, for example. So in a stroke patient, you might want to get them to think really hard about their leg to help them sort of connect with it again. In an FND patient, that makes it worse. The more they think about it, the worse it gets. So using those principles of distraction to try and promote automatic movement, um, And doing things that you would never dream of asking someone with a stroke to do. So Glenn might ask somebody to push a heavy piece of equipment across a room and film them doing it and then show them afterwards and say, look, when you were doing that, you were moving much better. I wonder how we can encourage that automatic movement without you having to 
be distracted. So Glenn, Glenn did a pilot trial of 60 patients published a couple of years ago with very promising results. There were 73% improvement in the intervention group of, and only 27% in a similar group of the same amount of physio, but just not specialised. And we're uh, just finishing off a large uh, multi-setter randomised trial at the moment in nearly 300 patients using that treatment. So we'll have some answers about how effective it is, I think. John, um, this podcast is also aiming at GPs. Is there any advice you can give these colleagues to quickly make the right diagnosis? You mentioned the Hoover sign, for example. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I think I think for primary care, my experience of talking to doctors in primary care is that they're really familiar with functional disorders. It's even more perhaps than we are. It's a bread and butter. But as a as a just a note of caution, if you've got someone with a, a neurological symptom that you think is functional, do do get the help from from a neurologist. I think this is not an area that's very easy to sort out, and I think a neurologist should be involved. But I think very often GPs are stuck with a patient with a neurologist who's not interested, a psychiatrist who says, I can't find anything psychiatrically wrong with this person. So it is helpful to know about these things if someone else has made the diagnosis. So Hoover sign, for example, uh, is a test where you uh, examine someone's hip extension and you can do that with them sitting down. So you just ask them to press their foot into the ground um, and see if they can keep it on the ground when you're trying to lift their leg up. So and people with functional leg weakness very often have weakness of hip extension. Uh, you can easily lift their foot off the ground. And then test their contra their hip flexion on the other side, usually on their better side. Do it against resistance. And you should feel that the hip extension that was weak has come back to normal. So that's demonstrating um, a problem with voluntary movement. The more the patient tries, the worse it gets. But normal automatic movement, that's... That's often a light bulb moment for both the patient and doctor when they find these things. Um, I think that pr you asked about functional disorders generally. I think those principles are harder to pull across to other disorders involving fatigue or pain or dizziness. But I, I think in cr my experience is that there are many characteristic typical features of those disorders as well. So someone who has widespread muscle joint tenderness, who has sleep disturbance, poor memory and concentration, almost certainly has fibromyalgia, and that which I would regard as a functional disorder. Um, and they can, and you can have similar conversations about how this is a positive diagnosis, um, how it's a problem with abnormal nervous system functioning. In that case, the volume knob turned up on pain pathways. Um, so. It's it's more of a challenge, but I think we can do it for other symptoms as well. I think for too long these we've been we felt uh, we've not felt empowered to make these diagnoses as as our as doctors a hundred years ago would have done, and patients with them suffer. You know they're not medically unexplained. We we can we know what they look like, and we have evidence based treatments for them, and we have a pretty good idea of what's going on as well. How do you actually explain to your patients about the the functional disorders? Yeah, but it, it certainly is an area that people struggle with, and it often goes wrong. And what you end up with is a sort of is an unhappy patient and an unhappy doctor as well. Um, and actually, I think the solution to that is, or, or the, the solution is to recognise that we do something weird. Often, when we talk to people, when when doctors talk to these patients. Normally, if you tell someone they've got Parkinson's disease, you, you say to them, I'm, I'm sorry, you've got Parkinson's disease. That's the first thing you say. So you tell them what's wrong. You don't say you haven't got MS or you haven't got a brain tumor, which is what very often neurologists will do to these patients. So tell the patient what's wrong and then, uh, and then talk to them about why, about something of the mechanism of the diagnosis. So I think what often goes wrong is doctors say, well, you've scan was normal, you haven't got MS, we think you've got this thing that might be stress-related. Um, now, immediately, what's happening there is you're, the doctor's jumping to a conclusion about a risk factor, which is common but not universal, 
and which is very stigmatizing. It's a bit like saying to someone who's just had a stroke, saying, well, you haven't got MS. Uh, we think the problem you've got is related to smoking, Yeah, which it might be. But if they're not a smoker, then it's not related to smoking. It's related to something else, because stroke is a multifactorial complex condition, just like FND. So we don't do that to people with stroke. So if we just do what we normally do, which is say, well, you've had a stroke. Uh, how do I know that? Because I've examined you and you've got features of a stroke. Might be able to see it on the scan. But what about Parkinson's? Can't see that on a scan. You've got features that are typical of the condition. And what does the, those features tell us? That there's a problem with your, the, with the functioning of your nervous system. And it must be a software problem because otherwise your tremor wouldn't stop or your paralysis wouldn't come back to normal. So I think if we just do things in a normal way, um, then things go a lot better. I think patients can tell when we're going off script and there's something weird going on. Um, and patients can also tell if the doctor doesn't really believe them. So if you you could say all the, you could say all the things I'm suggesting here, and it would still go horribly wrong if you fundamentally believe these people don't really have anything wrong with them or are wasting your time. Um, so at some level, you have to actually believe that the person does have those symptoms. I mean, I obviously do, um, but that that's another issue. So I think do, do what you normally do and don't do something weird would be my main message there. And leave the, leave the etiology to later because that's what you do normally as well. If someone said to you, why, well, yeah, but why have I got Parkinson's disease, doctor? You know, what would your answer be? Well, that's a, that's a complicated question. We can talk about it, but it's probably not going to help right now. Um, there's a few, you know, in fact, we know more about the etiology of FND than we do about Parkinson's disease, I would say, which is another reason why they should not be called medically unexplained. Um, so, so those, I, I don't, I think you have to use your own work. You have to use your, it has to match up with what you think. Uh, I don't, I'm not a believer that we should just be giving everyone scripts, but I do, I, I'd like to challenge people's ideas about, I think that's why doctors feel uncomfortable with these conversations, because they feel forced into doing, going down into a weird uh, order of talking about things. I guess if you can tell your patients that nothing is structurally wrong with their brains, with their nervous system, uh, it might be uh, a good way a good way to to tell them that um, the chances of of getting better are, are much greater. What, what do you think? I mean, well, again, I mean, it's yeah, it's okay to talk a bit about the fact that the structure is normal, but I think only after you've explained what's abnormal, because they do actually have something wrong with them, and it's quite a hard thing to fix. Actually, you know, if your 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 own brain is not working and it's doing something. Uh, strange for you How, it is quite a hard thing to fix and natural history studies of these disorders are not that encouraging actually the, we just did, did a 14 year study of people with functional limb weakness and 80% of them still had that symptom 14 years later that's a lot I mean that's they weren't quite as bad as the MS group but they weren't far off um, so <laughs> On our, I mean, of, of, in that study, for example, about a third improved or, or, or remitted uh, and a third sort of stayed the same and a third uh, were a bit worse. So that's, that's kind of what you see in many studies. I think, I think we've got to be careful not to say to patients, oh, look, you've, don't worry, there's nothing really, you know, there's no real problem here, so you're going to get better. It's like chronic migraine. You can't, that's, you, know, you can't see that on a scan either, but you wouldn't be that optimistic with your patient with chronic migraine. You would say, this is going to be difficult, but we'll try. And there is a possibility of what I think it's, what I think the prognostic studies and treatment studies show is that we're really bad at telling who's going to respond to treatment. I'm constantly surprised by people who I think were not good candidates for treatment who've done very well and people who I think was very optimistic about and didn't do so well. So you've got to give everyone a chance, I think. Um, give some optimism and hope. That's important. If you haven't got any hope, then it's quite hard to embark on rehabilitation. You need that. You need to think it's worthwhile. 
Uh, but don't be, uh, some people say, oh, well, you should just tell everyone that's going to get better. You know, what normally happens then is the patient is just deeply disappointed with you that you were wrong. So be, be realistic, I think. You pointed out that um, the treatment of FND is sort of a mixture from physiotherapy, maybe uh, a psychiatric um, treatment. Um, is there any medication that you think could be helpful um, for these kind of patients? There have been very few medication treatment studies in FND. There was one on um, there was one looking at an SSRI for seizures, um, functional seizures. I think um, I personally use medication for when I can identify a comorbidity that I know there's an evidence base for that medication for. So if the you know, pain, for example, occurs perhaps in 80% of people with functional motor symptoms. I mean, arguably, it's it's the same condition, really. Um, so, you know, things that you might try for pain or you might try for to promote sleep or if the person has depression or anxiety, then medication may be appropriate. Um, I spend a lot of time reducing and stopping medication in my patients. They're usually over-medicated particularly opiates, particularly uh, gabapentinoids. I think uh, all these, it, you, and I say to the patients, look, you've got a disorder where your brain's not working. We really need to minimize the amount of medication here because we want your brain to work better. Um, so so I, do, I do use some medication, but try to do it sparingly. I think seizures is a slightly different matter because those patients are having episodes that physiologically have a lot in common with panic attacks. And actually, that's that's kind of how I like to teach patients and doctors about them. They're quite they're really very similar in terms of episodes where people are losing control. Um, they get a massive sort of autonomic overactivity, um, and in fact, patients will often have panic symptoms they don't tell you about. So, I think in those situations, it's reasonable to think about medication that you might use in panic disorder, even if the patient is not feeling anxious or panicky they're at some level they are going into a state of red alert every time this happens uh, so that's a reasonable strategy and then there's 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 an there's a bit of an evidence base in um triple pd which is uh persistent postural perceptual dizziness type of functional dizziness um there may be a role there for some ssris and other that class of medicine For our listeners, is, it, is there any current literature you would uh, recommend to, to read to get some more information and some understanding of FND? Yeah, uh, I think the most the best recent review uh, I would recommend is in JAMA Neurology in 2018. First author is Alberto Espe, but that was, a, that was an international uh, authorship which I was involved with as well, and that's a very nice summary of the field. I would say, in terms of diagnosis, mechanism, evidence base. Um, I can recommend our new paper on 10 myths of FND, which is coming out this week in the European Journal of Neurology. Um, there's also the, there's a website I've made uh, for patients at neurosymptoms.org, and there is a, a German translation from our colleague Petra Schwingenschuh, who's in the... In, um, Austria, uh, that, that needs a bit of an upgrade, but there is a German version there, which we hope to improve some stage. But the, that, the, the, my version, of, uh, the English language version of neurosymptoms.org now has a lot of video material, introductions to the condition, animations for patients to help them understand uh, this condition. So we're, we're working quite hard to, on that sort of material. We think it's really important to... Um, part of that first step of treatment. John, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was really an honor to talk to you. And I really appreciate that you took your time tonight. I know that you're busy. No, that's no, that's very kind of you, Kai. I'm interested to hear how things are in Germany. I've got some colleagues who work there. I know it's you've got a long tradition there of psychosomatic medicine. But it always strikes me that although you have that, it somehow hasn't it hasn't translated into everyday practice in German neurology that I see in this, particularly for this area, it doesn't, I don't see German neurologists treating it that differently to anyone else, even though I know that you all have psychiatric training, etc. 
Thank you very much for listening. Please make sure to check out John's website on neurosymptoms.org, which has also translations in different languages. Also note that on fndsociety.org, there are free webinars on FND available for healthcare professionals at the moment. All the best to you and hope to hear you soon again.